Hello, my name is John Liu. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to speak with you. As a young man, I was a journalist covering the rise of China from poverty and isolation, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and other major geopolitical events. But when I was about 40, <clears throat> the World Bank asked me to begin a baseline study on the rehabilitation of the Lus Plateau, the cradle of Chinese civilization. And I was able to evaluate the importance of ecology in relationship to the importance of the political and economic developments of the time. And I found that ecology was much more important. It's now over 25 years since I've been observing studying, documenting, and communicating about the restoration of ecosystems. I began by filming and studying the restoration of China's Lus Plateau, which is the cradle of Chinese civilization. I think it's important to realize that this is where the Chinese race, the most populous ethnic group on the planet, came from. And when I first went to the Lus Plateau, it was fundamentally ecologically destroyed. A central figure in the restoration of the Lus Plateau was Jürgen Fogela of the World Bank. Now when we came to this place in the Lus Plateau the first time, we were all really shocked. You know, we thought, oh my god, you know, well, how can, how can ever anybody try to rehabilitate an area that is so huge and so fundamentally destroyed ecologically? And the truth is we spent two years working with the local people, with the farmers, with the local officials, with the, with the experts in the various fields of hydrology, soil and water conservation, forestry, agriculture, environment, try to understand what it would take to do something like this. And after two years, we still didn't have many answers. The World Bank didn't have the answer, and the local people didn't have the answer. And we spent another year and a half talking to the farmers in the villages, trying to understand what they had done in the past 20 or 30 years that were successful. And it was really interesting. Not much was there to show, because the current practices at that time were just not sustainable at all. The team continued to study with both Chinese and international experts. And gradually they found that the degradation and the causes of degradation were understandable. And they also found that they could, in a sense, reverse engineer what was happening to degrade the landscape to restore it. And so they began a very long, very large pilot project covering 35,000 square kilometers in order to restore basic ecological function to rehydrate dehydrated biomes, to restore soil fertility, to revegetate, and to restore the biodiversity. Over a period of about 10 years, it became apparent that this could lead to transformational change. They also found that actually this was a change in the intention of the society. So when everyone turned their attention to restoring ecological function, instead of extracting production from degraded landscapes, they could have a completely different result. And this result was very good. The, the fact was that what we saw was that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale degraded landscapes. The goal was to give a hat to the hilltops, give a belt to the hills as well as shoes at the base, the hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. 
The belt meant that terraces had to be built to be used for crop planting and also for trees. The shoes were the dams which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy as well as our lives could improve. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Now when it rains, the water no longer runs straight off the slopes. Trapped by the vegetation, it sinks into the ground where it is retained in the soil, taking weeks and months to gently seep down and irrigate the fields and terraces below. Restoration has occurred over an area of 35,000 square kilometers. Now since that time, I've been trying to extract what are the fundamental principles of restoration. I found that we can describe it relatively simply as the principles of evolution. So over evolutionary time, there was a constant accumulation of biomass and as each generation of life died and gave up its body, there was a constant accumulation of organic materials in the soils. So the geologic materials that had been there from geologic time were covered over by biological life over evolutionary time. And at the same time, there was a continuous increase in biodiversity. So these factors, biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, seem to me to be the basic building blocks of ecological function. They determine the height of the canopy. They determine how much water is maintained and circulated in the system. They determine the fertility of the soil. So these are the things which early human beings did not understand and they began to alter the situation. And so the historical development of human beings has been the reduction of biodiversity, the reduction of biomass, and the reduction in the accumulation of organic material. Following the documentation of the Lis Plateau, I was asked by the British government, the World Bank, and the Global Environment Facility to share this information with some countries in Africa. I presented at the Global Environment Facilities meeting in, in South Africa, and then I presented in Rwanda, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. And especially in Rwanda and Ethiopia, we have now a great deal of data from restoration efforts there. And we've seen that it's possible to rehydrate dehydrated biomes and that it's possible to revegetate areas that have been massively degraded over historical time and that have led to massive conflicts like famines and genocide. So the relationship between the ecological systems and the social political systems also seems to be quite clear. Many things that I've seen in Rwanda remind me of some of the things that I've seen in China. The Chinese government was asking this generation 
and all the generations alive today to change the course of human history, to take those denuded, the denuded landscape that they, they had and somehow alter this. How is it that it's possible for you to get the stream to flow throughout the year? It is because of the vegetation cover, which has been regenerating on this mountain. This water is maintained in the landscape because as soon as rain falls on the canopy, on this vegetation, that rain then infiltrated gradually into the ground, ending up with this steady flow of this river. Water is life. Without water, nobody can do anything. I'm amazed, as short as five years, six years, you get clean water like this, provided you work hard for restoring this degraded landscape. Now, what we've also seen in China is some extreme examples of restoration of desertified areas. So we can see that it's possible to, to restore dunes where the sands are shifting. It's possible to put shelter belts through the middle of enormous deserts. This example, for instance, is the Taklamakan Desert in Xinjiang. It actually, the name in the local language means you go in, but you don't come out. And the fact that you can put a vegetative corridor through the middle of the second largest shifting sand desert in the world suggests that we can do tremendous things. So we've seen that it's possible to take sand and to put in straw in grids. And just by putting straw in grids without planting anything, all water will be infiltrated uh, along the straws. Bacteria will grow and begin to deteriorate the, the straw, creating organic materials in the, in the sands. Then other, other sorts of things will be blown up, birds will land and leave their droppings, seeds will arrive, and without planting anything, it's also possible to see a, a revegetation in these areas. Now, it's very labor intensive, it's not easy, but it is possible. I've also had the opportunity to work with the Common Land Foundation, and this has given me the chance to go all over the world. I've been to 90 countries around the world, working with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and with the Common Land Foundation. And now we're seeing that there, there is a restoration uh, initiative on a planetary scale that's emerging. The United Nations, for instance, has um, declared the, the decade of restoration. It's also become clear that addressing ecological restoration in historically degraded landscapes is also the way to address social and economic problems and to create peace. When Matthias van der Hoffen, Thies, and his team came three years ago to the Common Land Foundation and presented their vision of the restoration of Lake Badarville and the Sinai Peninsula. It was a revelation. It's most definitely possible to reduce the temperatures in the lake and reduce the salinity and increase the fish stocks. This alone will be a major social and economic improvement for the region. But when you follow the integrated approach, the reed beds, the sea grasses, and moving onto the land with the, with the marine sediments, and restoring the soil fertility, infiltration and retention of moisture, lowering the surface temperatures, this is the only project that I know of that has the potential to have this kind of massive impact on a long-standing historical degradation. This is the type of transformation that is needed at this time 
that humanity is facing enormous challenges from climate change. And to, to shift the intention of the region to ecological restoration can lead to tremendous gains, both in ecological functionality, the robustness and, and, and resilience of the systems, but also in improved social and economic conditions and even in bringing peace. If this project reaches its full potential and the entire northern Sinai over the next few decades can be restored, it can hold the moisture in, and re restart the lower hydrological cycle. This could change the winds to bring back moist air from the Indian Ocean. This possibility is something that is so dramatic and so important for human history that it must be considered. I certainly hope we'll be able to work together in the future to make this a reality.